12, 13, 14, 15 and I have no idea how this happened. Hello everybody! My name is Karin Mayuka and today I would like to show you my analog film camera collection of 2020. Short disclaimer, I will not only show you my cameras, because I mean what's the point in showing you cameras you can easily look up on Google, but more than that I will talk a little bit about the history that I have with these cameras. So for example, how and why I got these cameras, what they mean to me and how they found their way into my collection. This might take a little bit of time, therefore make yourself comfortable, grab yourself your favorite drink, bear with me and let's start. First up, we have this camera. This is the Pentax MX. And this was the very first film camera that I ever bought. I bought this back when I was in school, I think around 2010 or something, before film was cool again. And I bought this at a local flea market for around 8 bucks, so it was a real bargain. And I took this with me a lot. The main reason for this is because it's super small, super compact. But unfortunately I did not take very good track of my negatives back when I was in school so I do not have a lot of the photos that I took back in the days. And today this is not my main camera that I use for an SLR and the reason for that is that it's kind of clunky now and I also think that it might have a fungus on the lens because it was not stored the best way it could. So it's not in the best condition it could be, but there's a lot of heart and a lot of memories to this camera. So I just hope that one day I can find a copy that's in better shape than this. And next up, we have this camera here. This is the Konica Auto Reflex TC. The story behind this is relatively long, but I can try to break it down for you. When I was in university, I was studying abroad for a year and I was living in Scandinavia for a while. Back in the day, I was shooting a lot of digital. So I decided to join the Photography Association. And when I did, I actually realized that they have a really well-equipped darkroom. I was very keen on trying to develop a roll of film for the very first time, trying printing and just getting all the way in into analog photography. The only problem was that I did not bring my trusty, lovely Pentax MX with me. So literally the next day I ran into all of the thrift shops I could find and tried to find an analog camera for me. And this here is what I found. And the lens on this is really gorgeous. It has a 50mm 1.4. And what's also important to know is that this camera does not have an inbuilt light meter. So the first, I think, 30 rolls or something that I took after my film revival were shot on this one. So I do really encourage people trying this out to learn photography by heart without having a built-in light meter. Even though I was enjoying not having a light meter, after some time I saw the advantages of a light meter and I wanted to get into the comfort zone of being faster and maybe even more efficient by having a built-in light meter. So I was very happy to pick this one up. And this is the Canon A1. A lot of you might know this camera because they either have the Canon A1 or the Canon AE1 or maybe AE1 program counterparts of this camera. And this is a very popular beginner camera and a lot of people tend to buy these when starting to shoot film. I do get why. Because these cameras are very easy to handle, they are very comfortable and the light meters are very precise. With this one I also got lucky because I got the 50mm 1.4 here. Most of the time when I carry an SLR, this one is my go-to one. Last but not least for SLR cameras, I do not only have one Nikon F3, but two Nikon F3s. Well, 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 you may ask. I randomly heard that the archaeological archive in the city where I live is switching from analog to digital. So I was all ears and I contacted the guy who is working at the archaeological archive and I asked him if he's maybe getting rid of some of the equipment and they did. 
So he told me that I could just come by and look around the archive and maybe see if there's something interesting for me. I picked up these two cameras for me because, well, I'm scared that one might break. Yes, I'm paranoid like that, so I have a backup one. And I picked up some film and I also picked up some cameras for some friends. And the cool thing is that I do not only have this viewfinder, the hip level or waist level viewfinder, but also the interchangeable eye level viewfinder. This waist level viewfinder would actually be a very good candidate for street photography. But the thing is, this camera has a very loud mirror slap. So I tend to not pick it up as often as I would hope. But oh my gosh, I wish you could look through this thing because the image here is just incredible. And I have to say, design-wise, I think this is one of the most beautiful SLR cameras or just cameras in general ever made. I think the design is beautiful and I just love the aesthetics of it. And the next camera we're all suckers for and it is my beloved Leica M6. Where shall I start? Honestly, the story behind how and why I got my Leica M6 is way too long to squeeze into one video or in, into this video. So let me know in the comments below if you would like to hear the story behind this camera so I can tell you a little bit about how and why I got this. Some, some specs about this camera. I got the titanium version Leica M6 and the non-TTL version so far. I think I shot around 8 to 10 rolls with it, so it's very, very recent in my collection. This was my dream camera for so long and I finally managed to make this dream come true, but I was very scared about how this would feel like and if I would actually enjoy shooting it. So I'm very happy that I do and I would never ever let this go again. So let me know if you want to hear a little bit more about this. Before I got my Leica M6, I did something I guess a lot of people did before buying a high quality rangefinder camera. I did try some other rangefinder cameras and one of them is this FET2. This is a Soviet or Russian copy of the old Leicas, the screw mount Leicas. I thought this might maybe be a logical thing to use because these ones are cheaper, they're quite easy to pick up. So I bought this one on something that's similar to Craigslist for very cheap. And I have to say these cameras are quite known for their lenses because they have a cool character, very swirly bokeh. And this one has as well. So I did enjoy shooting the camera in terms of the look that it got me. But the thing is, this viewfinder here is very dim, very dark, very foggy. And if you wear glasses like me, this is not a lot of fun because it has metal on here and not no rubber protection. So you can easily scratch your glasses and I can barely see any frame lines. <coughs> frame lines? What the hell are frame lines? Come on. <laughs> okay. And I can barely see any frame lines in this. The look of it is fine and I love it, but it's not a lot of fun to shoot. And I think this is very important too. If you want to take photos and the photos are good, you also need to enjoy picking up the camera. And I did not with this one. So the last camera in my rangefinder collection is this beautiful, beautiful Context 3A. And this is more of a... I would say collector's piece than a user's piece. I do not use this as often as I wish because it's very hard to focus and to adjust. It's quite old, it's a post-war camera and fun fact actually this is uh, the camera that Robert Kappa used to shoot or let's say this is the version that came after the camera that Robert Kappa used because he was using the one without a light meter. So this camera does have a very historical and nostalgic reason to it. That's also the reason why I'm giving this away. This is up for sale and I hope that maybe a, co a collector or somebody who enjoys shooting these historical cameras will find a better home for this. Because even though the lens on here, this size Opton Sona 50mm 1.5 is known to be one of the sharpest lenses ever made 
this does not make so much fun to shoot for me personally. And I got a version that's in very good condition. On the back here, this camera can have little bumps that are known as size bumps, which my version does not have. And I do have the a little bit, I think, rarer color wheel version. Maybe this will find a better home that I can offer for this. But I think it's beautiful and I love the historical and nostalgic part about this camera very much. And next up are point and shoots. And this one is the Yashica T4. And this is my go-to point and shoot. I do love this little guy. This is basically living in the pocket of my jacket because it's incredibly small. This fits everywhere and the lens is incredibly, incredibly sharp. When I was shooting the first rolls through it, I was blown away by the image quality. This is really incredibly good, especially for the size. <laughs> or oh, for the size. <laughs> I'm so funny. <laughs> this camera does have a 35mm 3.5 lens, not the 2.8 lens as the T3. But I think this is actually enough because I was shooting a lot of portraits with this as well and the background blur or bokeh is very creamy and smooth even though it does only have a 3.5 aperture lens. And the story behind this is quite interesting I think because I did not buy this. A lot of you might know that the prices on these little guys went up insanely high and for a point and shoot this is a lot of money you have to spend for one of those. I was browsing through analog photography groups and then I saw a post from a guy who said that he's not a point of shoot type of guy but he found this camera at a flea market, shot a roll through it but nope nothing for him. He doesn't want to be an asshole and sell it, but actually try to switch it up or maybe swap it for some other camera. And he was looking for a good quality SLR. I contacted him and I offered him one of my SLR cameras and he agreed, so we swapped. And now this is mine. Would I buy this camera? I don't know, honestly. I think if I knew or if I ever tested it, I would be very, very tempted to buy it. So I'm very happy that I didn't have to go this way. And I think this is also very good advice. If you are looking for a camera and you don't want to spend the money, but you have other cameras people might be interested in, you should definitely try to maybe switch it up, talk to people who might be interested in these cameras. Maybe you get to an agreement and you can find a camera that's a better fit for you and somebody else might find a camera that's a better fit for him. After I got the Yashica T4, I could not pass on this one. This is the Yashica T2. And this is the infamous brother of the Yashica T3, which is quite famous for its Carl Zeiss 35mm 2.8 lens. This has, just as the T4, a 3.5 aperture lens. To be honest, the reason why I bought this is just because the price was insane. I think I picked it up for like 15 bucks or something, so I had to get it. And also, I do love the aesthetics on it. I love the grip. And I think it's cool to also have a pointed shoot that's a bit boxier and a bit heavier, that feels a little bit more sturdy. But I think it would also make nice on the shelves paired with the T4. And who knows, maybe someday the gap will be filled and there will be a T3 in my shelf as well. But I have to admit for now, I'm quite happy with what I have, so yeah. The last point and shoot I have here is this Olympus, I always forget the name, a AF10 Super which is a very cheap and plasticky camera and this is exactly the reason why I got this. Why you may ask? Well, because I needed a camera that I could take with me on occasions where I do not want to bring the T4. Because with this camera I do not mind if it gets stolen, if it gets scratched, if I lose it or whatever. It's not very valuable in money. And after I had this I also saw some advantages of this camera. Because as you can see you can man manually turn on and off the flash. which not a lot of point and shoot cameras allow you to do, which is a big plus for me. Also, the image quality on this is very reasonable. I was not expecting this and I have to be honest that this cannot compare to the T4. The T4 is still better, but still, this nails the focus pretty much, I would say, 90% of the time and the images are very sharp. So just as a party camera, just as something quick and easy you can bring around, 
this is perfect and I really advise people to have a point and shoot that can get broken, that's not valuable, that they don't mind if something happens. So yeah, this is just a random camera I picked up and got very lucky because I do enjoy this. And here we are with medium format cameras. I do not have that many medium format cameras and this is I think the category that I would like to switch up the most in the future. The first one I'm going to show you is this Siegel 4B. This is I think a Chinese copy of the old Roliflex cameras. This one is a TLR camera, a twin lens reflex camera. So you have two lenses. This is the lens you look through and this is the lens you're actually shooting from. I got this as a very cheap alternative to other TLR cameras because I wanted to see if I like the system and take some time to get used to it. And it does take some, some time to get used to it indeed. And I'm very impressed by some photographer's work like Vivian Meyer because after having this in my hand and seeing that everything is twisted and just inverted, I understood, okay, this definitely needs some practice and this is not second nature for a medium format camera this is relatively compact and relatively light for me this is a perfect start and i might consider maybe upgrading sometime but this is a lot of fun and the image quality is enough for me right now there's another camera that's very close to my heart and it's this little plastic guy it's a polish camera called synchro Drew. And the story behind this is that this camera belonged to my father when he was a child. He got this camera when he was around 10 years old to his first communion. Just imagining my father running around town being the cool kid because he got a cool camera for his first communion is like insane for me to think of. And just recently he remembered that he has this somewhere in his cellar. So he looked for it, picked it up, had the box and the strap and everything with it. So this shows what good care he took of this when he was young. This camera does not have a lot of options. You have a manual mode, which is uh, I think around 150th or 160th of a shutter speed. You have bulb mode and then you have f8 or f16 and that's it. So in terms of quality and sharpness, I mean, no, this is this is not your best friend, but honestly, this is not what it's about. This camera for me is so much more, it's emotional value and it's personal connection. So I do shoot this a lot, if you believe it or not. I'm currently having a project with this one that I solely shoot on this camera. If you're interested in this, you should stay tuned. This will take a little bit of time until I'm finished, but it's by heart one of my most personal projects. I'm relatively new to instant cameras and this is the first Polaroid camera that I got. This is the Polaroid S670. Just imagine that this type of well-designed, intelligent, beautiful camera was already made in the 70s and this blows my mind. I love that it has a mirror and you can actually see what you're focusing on and I try to shoot this a lot even though shooting instant film got quite expensive recently. I basically shoot this when it's light or when I'm outside because the film for this is relatively low in sensitivity. Yeah, the compactness the size, the weight are just perfect to travel with. So when I'm going on a trip, I almost always carry this with me just in case I want to take some memories on Polaroid film as well. The last one was already serving me as a nice little backdrop here. And this is the Polaroid 636 close-up camera. This has a very classic Polaroid design. I basically use this when I want to shoot Polaroid, but it's dark because this has a built-in flash that the SX-70 does not have. And I do have some of the flash bars for it, but I do not have that many left, so I prefer shooting this one when it's dark. This has this very typical kind of party instant look to it, which I really enjoy. So for me, it's perfect having two different Polaroids for different situations, having one for daylight use and one for nighttime use. Okay, okay, 
There was a lot of cameras, I admit it. But the real question is, do I have too many cameras or better, do I really need that many cameras? And my honest answer to this is no. And yes, no, I do not need as many cameras as I have because I know that I cannot shoot all of them as much as I would love to do this. I see specific patterns that I pick some cameras up more often than others and some cameras tend to have a longer shelf life than others. Of course I have to say I love all of my cameras the same. Not true, I have some favorites. I think if you have less cameras you can focus on the ones that you're really shooting. So sometimes it can be a burden to have more cameras. But also I see myself in situations where I think it's very useful and very good that I have so many cameras. To give you an example, I do analog photography workshops, basically for friends, but also sometimes for strangers. And usually the people that are participating in these workshops do not have an analog camera themselves. So I'm very happy that for this particular reason I do have some spare SLR cameras in my collection that I can just borrow out to people that want to get into analog photography. And also I feel because I use and used so many different cameras, I kind of got to know my type of shooting style as well and I know what I like in a camera and I know what I don't like in a camera, which I think is very valuable. And I mean, this is my camera collection of 2020. My camera collection last year looked completely different and assumingly my camera collection next year will also look completely different. So there will be some switches, some fluctuation and we will see what's gonna happen. But I have to say that for now I'm very happy with the cameras that I have and I'm very happy that I found the cameras that I love to pick up and just shoot with and I think this is the main reason we should own cameras and have a camera collection to shoot. And I think that's a good last word so I will leave you to it if you like this video please leave a comment please share the love and don't forget to pick up your camera and go out shooting bye